Thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. And please give a very, very warm welcome to our amazing speakers. Yeah. Now, uh, our thanks go also to Louise and uh, everybody else here at Art Basel Hong Kong uh, who have uh, organized uh, the talks, and of course, to all of you for being here this afternoon. Uh, now, we thought it would be interesting to maybe begin uh, with uh, an introduction where everybody, because in a way, when actually Stephanie talked about this topic of institutional practice as creative work, uh, it made me think of something we often discussed with my friend Okvian Vezo, whom I want to remember here, the great Okvian Vezo, when we discussed about the importance actually of institutional practice as being interdisciplinary, as being a generalist practice, uh, something uh, Harald Seemann uh, always pointed out as well. And, uh, you know, he basically said the museum director and the curator's uh, role is a very generalist role. It involves so many things. But also, we often discussed about this idea that it's uh, to do with nonlinearity, right? And that is also something. Uh, I discussed with Lucy Lippard, another great pioneer, when you know, she was talking about the importance of uh, basically uh, institutional work and outer institutional work, activism, you know, many different things which can play a role in, uh, in an activity in, in, a, in a life. And very often, we come in a very non-linear way to an institution. So I thought it would be great that each of the speaker would somehow tell us how actually, as a matter of introduction, uh, he or she or they came to the current role about the non-linear journey. And uh, I thought it's also interesting because in a way, I always felt that um, uh, this non-linearity, I mean, Manuel de Landa talks about the thousand years of non-linearity is more important than ever before. And, you know, and I started to study economy and ecology because as a teenager, I believed a lot that we need to solve that equation. And, uh, then from there, organized an exhibition in my kitchen, and that exhibition became a rumor. And through that rumor, I got a residency at the Gatti Foundation in Paris, which allowed me to leave Switzerland. And then from there, uh, from that exile, I started to work in the museum, in the Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris. So, you know, as you can see, it's a very non linear process. And I think what is also interesting is that even if you project the future, the future will also be non linear. So I thought we could start with that, and maybe we can start with Antonia. Please give a very Warm welcome to Antonia Cavo. Oh <laughs> Whoa, thank you. How am I going to follow that? I have to come up with something. Um, so, how did I end up? Uh, well, yeah, very non linear and all over the place. Um, I studied sociology and anthropology at university, partly because I just wanted to be a student for as long as I could. And that was a four year course, and it took you on a trip somewhere. And um, so that felt like a good idea at the time. And then I had an Australian boyfriend. So I thought, right, I'll go to Australia and do my uh, kind of my dissertation and my research, because you had a year away uh, when you were doing anthropology to study something. And by kind of accident, I met people who were working at the Bumali uh, Aboriginal Artists Cooperative. So I started doing my research into uh, anthro uh, sort of Aboriginal artists that were living in the city. Um, and it's amazing to see Tony Albert's work here. If anybody hasn't seen it, please go see it. It's amazing. And, um, and then when I finished, you know, I had a social science degree. So what was I going to do? I worked in a bookshop and faffed around for many years and then kind of thought, well, I should pick up my thesis again. That was something to do with art. And through working in the bookshop, I met many people who had uh, PhDs in, um, or MFAs. Is this where everybody goes to retire after they really want to become to work in the arts? They end up in a bookshop. Um, and then I got writing for Art Asia Pacific and Art in Australia and sort of fell into that and came back to London, got into publishing via Art Asia Pacific because uh, they sort of recommended when you get to London, go see this friend and, and they'll kind of give you some work. And then got into working at Fiden. Then I was working with Iranian artists, so I thought, well, uh, let's go to Dubai. That's quite close to Iran. And um, from there, I can travel to different places. I'll stay there for two years and then do something else. And then, you know, 19 years later, I'm still there. And um, through Bidoon, I got working with uh, all the people at Bidoon and the art newspaper and still writing and writing. And then the art fair came, art, art Dubai came along and kind of said, you know, would you like to come and work with us? Because we'd been doing some things together and they wanted to really kind of consolidate the not-for-profit side of the fair as well as the commercial. So I ended up doing that. And then three years ago, I started working with Art Jamil. So I don't know, that's pretty random. 
Thank you very much. And now, please give a very, very warm welcome to Claire Sue. Um, thank you. Maybe um, I'll start a little bit before, well, 19, I was born in 1976, and maybe I'll, I'll start a little bit before that, um, when my parents uh, met actually on an airplane, so it does happen. Um, <laughs> and um, My father is Chinese from Hong Kong, my mother uh, is Austrian, and she was um, traveling at the time, and they thought it would be uh, a, good a, a good idea to, to hook up and... Uh, um, and then I was born. Um, <laughs> and my sister is actually here as well. So, <laughs> so this was in, in London at the time. And um, my, uh, my dad from Hong Kong was actually uh, working uh, in London. Um, my Austrian grandmother found it quite fantastic, actually, that there was a Chinese guy in the family. Uh, you hear of the first... You know, you hear of the, the first white man in the Chinese village. This was the first Chinese man in the Austrian village. Um, and in fact, when my grandmother passed away when I was seven, she was buried in a, in a Chinese Chang Sam. Um, so um, yeah, the, it, it worked. It worked. Um, and then, and then my mother. Um, anyway, we moved to Hong Kong when I was ten. I'm not going to go into too many details, but <laughs> we moved to Hong Kong um, when I was ten. Uh, I ended up going to the German Swiss uh, school here. Um, and one thing led to another. I have to say that growing up in Hong Kong, there wasn't awfully, uh, there aren't many places that one can actually see art. Um, but I was very lucky that we did have some artwork at home, and so you know I was exposed to that. Um, when I was 16, uh, I finished my A-levels, and my mother decided it would be a very good idea for me to go to Beijing. And so I took a year off, and I thought, oh yeah, I'm going to go find my roots. I'm going to go spend half the year in Beijing and half the year in Vienna. You know, um, of course, I came back even more confused. Um, but Beijing in 1993 was a very, very different place to what it was today. Um, but it was definitely, uh, I would say, this moment that um, sort of opened up um, kind of what was going on in the in the art scene. And I was there in, in a university called Beida for a few months. Um, and the last night um, happened to meet an artist, uh, a group of us met a group of artists uh, in the restaurant next door, and they led us to uh, what was called the East Village. And, and on that night, um, I actually was uh, got to see what was uh, Beijing's uh, most exciting underground uh, art scene. So that was when I was 17, and it kind of just opened up this, this space, and I was like, wow, I'd never heard of this. And you know, I thought China was so closed off, and I had no idea that there was this avant-garde underground scene going on. And, and then I kind of left and forgot about it for a while. Um, I then went on um, to SOAS. I studied Chinese and uh, and uh, um, Chinese and Chinese history. Um, and then when I'd finished that degree, I realized something was still missing, and I really wanted to to go and study art. So continued and did my masters uh, in history of art. Um, this was the old stuff, so studied ceramics and ink painting. Um, but then there was these, you know, the, those moments in Beijing that keep coming back, and I was like, no, I really want to to be able to somehow engage in what was happening in the current time, in this moment in time. Um, and so I managed to convince uh, my professor at SOAS, which was a very conservative institution at the time in terms of anything beyond the 20th century, um, for me to do my dissertation on, um, on a more recent art history from China, so the 1990s, and this was in 1998. So I understand that it might have been difficult for him to, to allow that, but he did. So went to the library and realized that there was very little material that went beyond the 20th century. Um, coming back to visit um, my my family in Hong Kong, um, I was very lucky to meet a gentleman called Johnson Chang, um, who's the founder of Han Art TZ Gallery here, and uh, I did an internship with him. And this was actually um, this was in oh, this was before slightly. This was 1997. <laughs> yeah, not memory definitely gets non-linear. It's all mixed up now with the different <laughs> years. Um, and through Johnson, um, again, I was opened up, and who was introduced me uh, by a gentleman called uh, Sir David Tang. Um, and the China Club, while it was not a very public space at all, was probably one of the few places that you could see Chinese contemporary art uh, in Hong Kong at the time. Um, so through Johnson, I was, I was um, actually given the assignment to look after um, the archives um, 
of Han Art Teaser Gallery. So my summer was spent organizing uh, Han Art Teaser Gallery's archive. Um, and by the way, I run an archive now, so um, it was very useful. It was good preparation. Um, and in conversation uh, with Johnson Chang, actually, at the kind of frustration of the lack of materials, um, the lack of uh, research and scholarship in the field, um, the idea was born. He said, why don't you just come back and set up an organization that really looks at these gaps within the field? And so that was in uh, 2000. Uh, so the Asia Archive um, is 19 years, will be 20 years um, next year. I think we'll, have, we'll speak a bit about the organizations and stuff later, so I'm not going to go uh, into that. Um, but yeah, one thing I just want to add is that later on, I discovered um, that my great-grandfather on my Austrian side was actually an archivist as well. So um, he had archived the entire region of the place in Austria we were from called the Mühlviertel, which is near Linz. Um, and at home, I, I went there and I discovered these incredible archives that he kept and during World War II, a daily record of everything that had happened in the region. Uh, he was constantly um, engaging with uh, farmers in the area who wanted to sort of modernize their homes and get rid of their old furniture. So he was giving them the new furniture and taking the old furniture. Um, so I also discovered later on, and, and you know, this was after I'd set up the Ajo Archive, that, oh, so maybe there is an archival gene that gets passed on as well. Um, so, you know, we also have to think about the nonlinear beyond just our lifetimes, but obviously the lifetimes before us as well, and how memory can also come through DNA too, as we can see, like, do I have my dad's nose or whatever. Or, um, but anyway, I'll probably stop there, because otherwise I'll... Thank you so much, Claire. And now please give a very, very warm welcome to Jana Peel. It's like this every day with Hans Ulrich. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I love this idea of discussing the link between linearity and creativity. And I think it's been said that logic will take you from A to B and creativity will take you everywhere. Uh, that's certainly been the case for me, uh, Russian born, Canadian bred, British educated, uh, blessed to have been here for seven years um, and then found my way back to London. Now, um, in terms of what we were discussing this morning, Hans Ulrich likes to say that Paul Clay suggests that art makes the invisible visible. Um, he also says that a line is a dot that took a walk. Um, and for me, that walk has meant um, that my line has become incredibly circular. Um, I'm looking now at Nick, at Anna, our friends from the Arts Council. And when I thought about that circuitous route, it was actually Saturday night at the Tate Museum um, in a queue for Anne Imhoff, where I uh, came upon Nick Sirota, who um, ran the Tate for many years. And I said, Nick, do you remember 2006? We're standing in this queue, and that was the year that we, as Outset Art Foundation, actually bought the first work of performance for Tate with our foundation. And in fact, it was a queue of people uh, purchased at an art fair by Roman Ondek um, called Good Feelings and Good Times. Um, so when I think to the linearity or the circularity of my journey, what's always been at the core uh, is this crush on talent, uh, realizing that I could never sing or paint uh, or create conceptual art. For me, it was always this idea of production um, and of enabling that creativity and genius to thrive. And as I found myself on the trading floor at Goldman Sachs, I actually, about 16 years ago, found my way to the Serpentine Galleries, and that's where I got to experience the joy uh, after 97 sensation show at Royal Academy of these YBAs that the Serpentine actually allowed a banker like me to sit next to at dinner. Uh, and that was incredibly radical to think about that connection between patronage uh, and creativity. And it reminded me of that Andy Warhol idea that good business is really the best art. So seven years into Goldman Sachs, 2003, we came to Nick Sirota at the time, who was running Tate, and said, we have this crazy idea. We want to gather a group of people before Kickstarter in a very Luddite way and ask them to chip into a pot and to be able to enable works to be bought from a fair for the Tate collection. And between Amanda Sharp and Matthew Slotover and Nick Sirota, everyone looked at us and said, that sounds really crazy. Um, all right, fine, let's do it. 
And that's how this idea um, of crowdsourcing for the arts um, grew into my first journey outside of uh, the commercial world. And that became Outset Contemporary Art Fund, um, which has since raised tens of millions of dollars and really encouraged uh, wonderful uh, projects like Steve McQueen's project for Venice um, and hundreds of work for public collections um, to find their way into international museums. Having had this wonderful run at Outset, I moved to Hong Kong in 2003. Uh, and then I found this incredible community of people, people like Mimi Brown, who's in the audience, who would go on to start Spring, Asia Art Archive, uh, and incredible people that I just really wanted to become friends with. Um, and again, like those serpentine days, I thought, how can you uh, contribute to a community in any small way you can? And for me, that meant uh, aligning myself with the great work that was happening at Parasite uh, and taking this incredible institution uh, that had for over a decade been the safe space for unsafe ideas uh, in uh, such a busy street on Poyan and thinking how in my small way uh, I could contribute to the success of Parasite. Um, and for me, that was the most uh, meaningful uh, endeavor um, to be able to join this community uh, and find a group of people who were all uh, really driving this desire to inspire the widest audiences with the urgency uh, of art in Hong Kong and to bring the best of Hong Kong to the world and the best of the world to Asia. Um, so having been tremendously grateful for that opportunity uh, at Parasite, I also realized that there was perhaps an opportunity um, to bring debate and discourse um, to this incredible community um, and to shed heat and light on the biggest issues of the day. Uh, and so there was an organization called Intelligence Squared um, that grew out uh, of London's Forum of Civilized Aggression. It was some journalists uh, who loved to debate big issues, and I'll never forget that first debate with the late Sir David Tang, uh, where we debated at this fair uh, 10 years ago whether cultural treasures belong in their country of origin. Uh, and again, the debates went on, Marina Abramovich, Hans Ulrich Obrist, Anthony Gormley, Tim Marlowe. Uh, we had the most incredible decade uh, of challenging and, and fascinating discussions um, and really being able to bring to people together from both sides in a really constructive dialogue uh, to further progress. And then three years ago, uh, four years ago now, um, I was fortunate, Hans Ulrich Obrist and our chairman, Michael Bloomberg, uh, invited me to join the board of the Serpentine Galleries uh, just as I was making my way to America as my husband was um, taking a journey, uh, an academic one then. Uh, and again, finding my way back to the Serpentine, I would sit across from the then director who'd been there for 23 years and offer crazy ideas um, that just seemed too radical to ever envision. Uh, and before I knew it, I had moved from the board seat to the hot seat. Uh, and after Hans came over for several 6 a.m. breakfasts, which my son called brutalism breakfasts. He'd heard there was something brutal, but he thought it must be brutalism. Uh, Hans Lorick and I, as very old friends, decided to become new collaborators, um, and the journey at Serpentine began. So we'll talk about it as we move into the next stage, and I'd love to pass on to Doreen, who does amazing work. Um, but what that has afforded me to do in terms of institutional practice uh, is to really reimagine what it means uh, to be a uh, museum without an art collection, uh, to be in a landscape which demands sustainability in the heart of Kensington Gardens, to think that next year, um, as a museum without a collection, you know, we hit half a century, and now rather than mm -hmm. one small tea house, we have a campus extended by the late, great Dame Zaha Hadid. So the kinds of things we're thinking about are how to build on the success of the first half century and to re-envision uh, what exhibition making could look like for the next 50 years. Thank you so much, Jana. And now, please give a very, very warm welcome to Doreen Sibanda. Thank you very much. Um, well, it's very fascinating to hear people's stories. Um, mine is, uh, I, I was actually um, uh, born in the UK of Caribbean parents, Jamaican parents, and uh, grew up there um, as my high school as being sort of one black girl until form three in the whole school. So I had a lot of uh, interest in identity and heritage and all these sorts of things. And I went, uh, I was very interested in the arts from like form four and I studied it. And uh, I 
I am trained at, to, at a tertiary institution to be an art teacher. I wanted to be an artist, I wanted to be a designer. My folks were saying, no, 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 you've got to have something. It's either a teacher or something. And uh, I did that and um, learned quite a lot, actually. And then I met a Zimbabwean gentleman <laughs> and married him. <laughs> and we moved to Zimbabwe just at the time of independence. So that took me in an, another trajectory, which was not very different from probably the way I'd seen my life going. Um, I, uh, as soon as I got there, I discovered the, the I, I looked out for the gallery. Um, I was aware that there was one. And uh, the first few months, I, I was painting at the time, and the gallery uh, purchased one of my works. I entered it into an exhibition and they wanted it, and so I, I had no idea what was going to come next, but I sold the work, and within a year or so, there was an opening at the gallery for an education officer. And I'd started on a master's program. I dumped it because I thought the job in the gallery was really what I wanted. And so I, I moved into the gallery. I worked there for eight years in charge of educational programming. Uh, this is just at the time of independence. A lot of things changed uh, from what it was until what it became. And uh, the first director there was a gentleman called Chris Till, who went on to do great things in Joburg uh, with the Apartheid Museum and uh, the Gold Museum. And so when he left, I thought, right, I'm ready for this job. I was like in my 20s. Nobody took me seriously. I didn't get it. <laughs> I didn't even, I didn't even, I don't think I even formally applied, but I realized this is what I want. I want to work in this gallery. Um, in 1988, my husband was posted overseas, actually, to Soviet Union at the time. And so I moved. I left the gallery, um, sadly. And, but I had a, an incredible time. It was an incredible time in, in uh, Russia then. Soviet Union turned to Russia. We spent uh, six years at the most amazing moment from Soviet to, to Russia. And then uh, we, we came back to Zimbabwe in the early uh, 1994. And uh, the job was going again, the director's job. And I did apply. I didn't get it. And so I thought, well, this is not meant for me. I opened a private gallery then, actually, in 1996, a contemporary gallery for artists in Zimbabwe. Um, did, did good work, commercial, commercial gallery. And uh, by 2000, the economy was really sort of not, not going well. And so I closed it in 2001. And uh, a few months later, I found myself on the board of the National Gallery. And uh, the, the then director who had gotten the job in 94 was leaving in 2004. And uh, the board people would say to me, but surely you want the job. And I said, no, I, I, I know what the job involves now. It's all about money. There's no money and you're going to spend all your time looking for funds and I don't want it. But many people persuaded me, this is the job you've always wanted. And I applied and I got it. So I've been there as a director since 2004, January 2004. And uh, it's been a, a rough ride, but a very satisfying one. Um, the gallery, I think I'll talk about the gallery as we go along. But when you talk about non-linear um, situations, I think that certainly has applied to me. And uh, I, I, it's, a, it's a great environment. Uh, there's a, a, the gallery that I work in has been established for some years, so I think I'll go into all that as we go along. But thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and uh, to, uh, to represent my gallery here in this institution. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, uh, Doreen. And now please give a very, very warm welcome to Pavi Mahasrin Rand. Thank you. Um, I, I was trained in, in theatre. And I, I was teaching uh, uh, theater management and, and film and theater criticism for 25 years at uh, Chulalongkorn University, which is uh, Thailand's uh, oldest university and supposedly the most conservative. Um, I, was, I was also running a, a black box theater there. And uh, with that uh, opportunity, I, I worked uh, with many uh, cultural institutions and uh, many performing arts groups from, from Asia and also from Europe. Um, and then... Um, the the art center that I'm, I'm running right now, the BACC, uh, is now only 11 years old, um, and I have been the director for only one year and one month. Uh, and the reason why I made uh, the biggest decision of my life, okay, I mean after 25 years in academia, uh, to apply for this job is that I I saw that 
um, the the center is is more than a museum, but it's a museum uh, plus something else. Uh, there are four restaurants. Uh, there are two cafes. There, there's a library. There's a auditorium for film screening, for seminars, talk discussion. There's a black box studio for performance as well. And and uh, the most important of of which I think is that uh, uh, we had um, 1.8 million visitors uh, in a year. So I think it's it's um, it's a lively place, and it's um, I always say that it's something that I I care for, and I I um, and I, I I mean to tell you the truth, I I was applying to to this job when it was uh, it was on the rise. We it, it became like more popular, and and well, and part of it is because it, it's free admission, so anybody can come into the the center, and of course that we take donation, but it's uh, I think it's important for. Uh, for the development of, of art in Thailand to have to have a place like this in in the city center I mean we are uh, I mean that the center is uh, 12 story high uh, 25,000 square meter uh, in a very uh, commercial uh, commercially valuable area is it the only I, I, I always say that it's the only the only building in the area that's not a department store but it looks like one, and it feels maybe it feels like one. But that's welcoming for anybody to come in and to and to enjoy art. And then I think, especially in in a country where uh, art appreciation art appreciation is not taught, it's important to to create a kind of a welcoming experience. So um, I apply for this job because I, I see that it it's on the rise. And then I was having uh, difficulty um, uh, at at university as well. I, I was. I feel that um, the direction of uh, contemporary arts is uh, moving towards uh, interdisciplinary approach, but uh, in academia we are not doing that. Okay, uh, art schools are still pretty much like segregated into, I mean, visual arts into, well, even in performing arts, like dance students are not collaborating with theater students, even though they share some of the same studio, they share the same building. Um, and then, and then, film students uh, do not uh, collaborate with uh, visual art students. I think that's that's against what uh, professional artists are doing, like these days. Uh, so I feel that I mean, by uh, by by taking on this job, I have the opportunity to to bring together like people from from different fields in in this place because it's it's uh, because of the, the welcoming, uh, um, I mean, uh, building. Uh, uh, air that we, we're trying to, to create. Uh, it's, it's kind of like a meeting spot for uh, artists of different fields in Bangkok, not not only uh, visual arts, even though, of course, the visual arts is our uh, priority. And then I feel that, uh, I felt that at um, uh, 45 years old, I still need to learn. And I have been learning a lot in, in, in one year of, of being a director here. And then uh, I was telling you that I, I saw the center on the rise. I mean, in every every aspect, but then when I when I became a director, like two months into my directorship, uh, we had a problem. We had a big problem uh, with the with the city who who owns the center and used to support the center. And I, I and we have been uh, trying to find like many different ways to uh, to solve the problem. Uh, and then it's um, I think it's well people people said that had I known uh, this problem, would I take this job? I I, I would say yes. Because it's it's the most challenging, and uh, I I meet uh, new people every day. Uh, this is my first time at at Art Basel, uh, not the first time in Hong Kong. Okay, I've been to Hong Kong many times, but never to Art Basel. Uh, so it's it's learning, and I I meet uh, new people every day. And I think um, the world is getting smaller, so I think people people from different fields uh, need to meet. And I I'm enjoying my my dream job because of the the one decision I made and the second job I ever applied for. Thank you very much. Okay. Probably thank you so, so much. Now round two. Uh, actually, uh, when Stephanie came uh, with, up with the title, right, this idea of institutional practice as creative work, the question, of course, came up, you know, how could we address it? It's a very immense topic. Uh, and uh, we promised it would not be a marathon because otherwise we'll be here tomorrow morning. So the question, of course, is how could we narrow it down? And there are, of course, so many aspects of creativity 
within institutional work. It's not only uh, the program, but it is all the other aspects of an institution as well, which need to be invented, reinvented. Fundraising is an important aspect, organizational structures. There are many different dimensions no, to this aspect of, um, of creativity. And then, of course, I would say there is also uh, the difference between the idea of the creativity of inventing a new institution or the idea of uh, permanently reinventing an already existing institution. Uh, I'm contributing at the moment to this new adventure of Alex Poots. In, um, in New York City, the, the shed, which is uh, this rare occasion where actually a new institution is invented from, from scratch. And uh, the Los Confidio Renfro and David Rockfield are building this extraordinary architecture on, on wheels. And of course, the question there is, I mean, Jana mentioned Steve McQueen before. The question was, of course, how with artists like Steve McQueen invent a way of working in an institution which is not the museum to do projects which could never happen in a museum to do interdisciplinarity. So Steve will actually, for the opening of the shed, curate a program of um, African-American music. It's like a tree of African-American music performed by many younger practitioners who will actually perform this uh, canon and reinvent this canon, the future being invented with fragments of, uh, of the past. Or collaborations are happening like uh, Steve Reich and Gerhard Richter are doing work for each other. So Steve Reich was asked to do a composition and, you know, and, and, and Gerhard Richter actually an installation which somehow connects to the music of Steve Reich. They kind of cross influence each other. It's almost like Cunningham and, and Cage. And then Trisha Donnelly will develop something which is not yet defined and which is really a work in progress, a secret to be open. So that idea you know, of a new institution. But then, of course, the daily practice of reinventing existing institutions is also a very exciting aspect. And that is really a way maybe we can all, through case studies of these five institutions, answer Stephanie's question. So the question is, how do you see institutional practice as creative work in relation to the work that you are currently engaged in? And we start again with Antonia. Thank you. I love this game show format. It's great. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely the newbie on the block here, and it's you know a real honor and privilege to be sitting with people who've been running institutions for a, a long time, or their institutions have, have existed for a long time. Um, Art Jamil has been working since 2004, but we just opened our first building last November, the Jamil Art Center in, in Dubai. And I definitely agree with you that, uh, you know, running an institution is definitely creative work. If you think of kind of, you know, creativity being, you know, imagination plus originality plus collaboration plus problem solving, then we can build, you know, kind of uh, creativity in everything we do, whether it's working, you know, having negotiations with uh, municipalities or fundraising, as you mentioned, um, making cre very creative budgets, sometimes we're forced to do, as well as the actual pro the process of exhibition making. But I guess what I'm interested in, because we're still, uh, you know, we're very young and kind of slightly utopian in our thinking at the moment uh, in the institution I work with, is about how can you create a kind of institutional character that constantly lends itself to, to reinvention and constantly kind of uh, grills itself on, on where it's going. So the building itself, uh, designed by Siri, if I keep talking long enough, my slides are going to come up, but I think you've already seen them about 20 times. But um, the, <laughs> the, the building a brief was for Siri, who are uh, architects based in London, to create a building that was extraordinarily open and inviting to all audiences. And you'll see from the architecture that it's open on all sides. And then during that building process, we tried to map the kind of philosophy of the organization against the actual building process as well and create a kind of program that was incredibly porous for audiences as well as artists. I mean, we're working in a very, very young country. I mean, the UAE will be 48 years old this year. So it's very much in a kind of process of thinking what it wants to be as a country and a society. And it's also a very future-oriented society. So one that's constantly talking about where do we want to go, what are our plans for the next 20, 30 years, which is very refreshing having been working in, in Europe before. There's a very different kind of mentality. So there's a role that we can play there where we're, where we're taking an art program and building it out into one of debate. And yeah, I came to that Intelligence Squared debate 10 years ago and was inspired very much by what was said there on the stage, you know, that we can really take debates right into the heart of every, everything we're doing and open up that space to the public. Um, and you mentioned Okwe at the beginning, and you know, recently I reread an interview with him where he talked about this idea of kind of museum citizenship. You know, that museums have a have an absolute fundamental role to play in reflecting the world that's around them, rather than sort of trying to please the what can be imagined as the lowest common denominator. 
Um, maybe I won't go too much into the program. I mean, we have three floors of exhibition space. Um, we have a collection, so we're a kind of institution that does have a collection, but we don't really have permanent hangs. We just use the collection as a source of inspiration in our programming, and we build into that. Um, and again, I mean, more sort of inspiration from colleagues around, uh, around the table. I mean, Asia Art Archive was a huge inspiration to us when we came to our library. It's I'd visited you many times and also worked for Innova and around with the Innova Library in the 90s. So this was two sort of sources of inspiration for our library, which began as a kind of, you know, let's have some books that, to accompany our exhibitions. And that quickly, that uh, thinking kind of totally flipped to thinking of the library as the kind of brain of the organization and a place of knowledge production, knowledge sharing, and a place of kind of very intense collaboration. So we build out our library through working with the artists uh, that we're exhibiting. Uh, we do crowdsourcing for our, our library books. We invite scholars to come in and create bibliographies. And it's very much a process of kind of building uh, something together. And then that feeds through to the exhibition programs. Um, we have a very strong emphasis on education. Uh, we open, for example, with a children's opening for 400 school kids. They, uh, you know, this for 90% of those school kids who came on that day had never been to a museum before. So it, I'm sure that's the similar for many uh, colleagues here. You know, it's a process of really being able to open up to the community. Um, the youth assembly. We have nine 18 to 24 year olds who run their own programming. And on April the 26th, they do a takeover of the building. And I really stupidly, again, in this utopian way, said, yeah, carte blanche, go for it, do whatever you like. And now I'm kind of slightly thinking, ah, what are they going to do? But anyway, we'll see. And then this process of kind of learning, as, as you just mentioned as well, is a sort of, we think of it as a 360-degree process. So how do we keep the intensity of how much we learnt in the six months up to our opening and through our opening as a constant within the kind of the, the system itself? And also just to really think about context and hyperlocality as absolutely key to everything we do. So we sit on the creek of Dubai, which is the kind of artery that made the city what it is. It, it developed the kind of trading uh, mentality of Dubai. It opened it up to different nationalities. It's the, the water that flows to South Asia, to Iran, to East Africa, and connects us with our local kind of geography. So we think of that kind of being able to see the water and the ebb and flow of kind of trade and ideas as being central to everything, the program, the way we approach everything. And, um, you know, perhaps we're in a sort of particular position in that, you know, we're uh, non-governmental, we're private and independent, but at the same time, the government um, kind of has embraced us as representative of the city. We have a totally civic kind of mentality and, and mandate as well. So we're in a very particular position and also in that kind of privileged position of being able to kind of work with government to try and open up space for others. So when we came along, you know, they kind of said, we don't have any legislation that applies to you, you know, even importing work in. They would say, well, are you a commercial gallery or are you governmental? And we were kind of, oh, we're sort of in between. You know, so now we're in that kind of conversation with government of, okay, can we actually invent new laws that allow us to do what we do. So that process of kind of R&D is, is really interesting. Um, and this kind of fluidity of how do you keep sort of reinventing yourself. Um, I think you work with Victoria Ivanova, right, at the Serpentine. She's a researcher that I just uh, heard speak at the Global Art Forum at Art Dubai last, last week. And everything she said made, I think she's doing a residency with you as part of the digital, uh, digital team at, at the Serpentine. But everything she said made suddenly perfect sense about this idea of kind of, if we understand arts institutions through the lens of, of research and development, it makes us kind of question all the institutionally naturalized assumptions that we have. And we need to be able to sort of turn those inside out and really shift our perspective on the institutional practices that we assume we should have. And as a young organization, we're constantly debating, you know, we must have best practice, but then what is best practice? Are we supposed to sort of download it from somewhere else and apply that? Or can we actually invent our own best practice? And how do we prevent our best practice becoming our only practice? How do we kind of keep reinventing ourselves? Um, so this idea, we decided, you know, this kind of idea of being very porous can start with the building, it can then go into the program itself, and then can then kind of come from the artists we work with. So we really challenge the artists to constantly challenge us. 
Um, one very quick, I don't know what I'm doing for time, but one very quick example. Um, we have an, an artist's room at the moment with a fantastic artist called Hemily Butter. She works with materials that disintegrate over time. You know, we had this huge debate, like as a collecting organization, if we collect one of your works, you know, it, it is going to carry on mutating into something else. We have this fantastic silicon rubber work that is by being exposed to the, the air is changing all the time. By the time we finish this exhibition, it will have disintegrated slightly and then we have to sort of put it very carefully back in its crate, put it back in the storage and think, is it, when we get it out again, is it going to be you know, crumbs? Will we have anything to show at all? And obviously that's completely against the nature of a collecting institution. You know, the conservation people were kind of, what, you know, this is, we can't deal with this. You know, what does it mean? What have we just spent our money on? And that kind of process sparked a debate. We've invited her to come back and work with us to figure out what is best practice when the art you collect um, is going to deteriorate over time deliberately so? And how do we kind of embrace that with the artist? We work a lot in this kind of research studios where we open up research to the public and allow the public to intervene in the research. Um, at the moment, we have a great um, kind of experimental exhibition by Rand Abdeljaba, who's looked at a minaret in um, Iraq, which is now, uh, thanks to a dam and then Al-Qaeda and then ISIS is now in the fourth time it's being rebuilt. And her research, is, she just sort of exploded her research all over the, the library and the corridors. It includes videos and photos and family archives. And then she's inviting people, particularly from Iraq, to come and look at this research and contribute back, you know, their own perspective on this research. And to, you know, disagree with her if they, if they like. And that is kind of all built into it. And it challenges us as well, how we think about that. I think I'm going on too long. But this kind of, I guess in our region and particularly maybe in the UAE, this idea that the arts can be a kind of Trojan horse that allows you to discuss things that you can't otherwise discuss in society is particularly kind of rich for us. So every exhibition sparks debates, we try to draw in particular kind of strands of the public, be they poets, um, writers, the kind of literary crowd, people that don't normally engage with contemporary art, and try to uh, you know ask them to kind of contribute back to the exhibition and to use that to figure out what kind of community and what kind of society can we be. And we hope that kind of R&D laboratory kind of feel will then open up a space for people to really think what can community be in a particular environment like the one we work in. Thank you so much, Antonia. And now, Claire. Um, yeah, so, well, the pr creativity, as you said, that was a, a huge premise to begin with, and it's obviously a word that has been appropriated um, by all sorts of sectors um, of uh, the society. Um, so how to make this <laughs> an interesting r response? Hmm. So I was just thinking a little bit about, um, you know, it was uh, from a more sort of personal institutional point of view. Um, but maybe just very quickly, for those of you less familiar with the Asia Archive, we were founded uh, in 2000 and we are dedicated to a more generous art history. And what that means is that when you uh, learn about the art history of um, the 20th century, um, while things are changing now, uh, when we began, it was definitely from a very Euro-American centric point of view. And so after the last, for the last um, 19 years, we have been building uh, a library that's open and publicly accessible. We have been digitizing archives across Asia, from mainland China to Hong Kong, um, to India, Pakistan, um, to uh, Singapore. Um, and digitizing those, um, we don't buy archives, and I think that was a very important thing. So really, we were founded um, with the, uh, in, the in, a, in a digital age, and for us it was very important that we don't buy archives because we don't want to repeat a kind of colonial process of taking knowledge and materials out of their sites of origin and bringing them to Hong Kong. So it was really more about how do we uh, duplicate um, and pre perhaps present these in a different way and make them publicly accessible and preserve them for scholarship and research and education. And also, how do we change the economics of research? Because it can be very, very expensive as well to, to go across the world and do your research. But by putting all of these primary source materials online, it means that now you can be sitting behind your computer screen uh, 
so long as you have internet access uh, wherever you are in the world, um, and you can actually access these materials as well. But then the idea that this is not just a static collection waiting to be discovered um, by a scholar or a researcher with kind of dust piling up, which is our usual idea of what an archive is, uh, but really something that is constantly activated uh, through different programs, um, through high schools, uh, through um, universities, but from more scholarly. And then, of course, um, the archive as a creative space as well. So inviting artists in, which has been very important to us as well to activate the archive. Um, many artists who are very interested in ideas around history, around memory, around um, the structures of an archive as well. Um, so again, yeah, these slides are, <coughs> are running, but I don't know if you had a chance to see some of them. And, and I chose a few of them for, for a purpose. So the first three slides, um, when I was just thinking about, you know, how, how, what does it mean um, to run uh, an organization? I would say that there is this constant kind of shift between you know, the day-to-day the -day duties and then also constantly forcing yourself to take a step back and to, to ask the question of you know, what, what is it that you're contributing um, to the field? Uh, because we tend to be very inward looking within the art world or within any of the worlds that we work in. Um, so constantly trying to, to look out from multiple perspectives. And that's why you'll see the first three slides are kind of moving from our library uh, with a headshot above the, the building and then um, into the universe because I think we have to be constantly looking at all of these perspectives. And then I just also put together a kind of one of the slides as well, which was also showing the kind of different circles that we operate within as well. So from our mission, um, then comes our values, how we engage with the world around us and our communities. And I think values is really, really important. And then from our values, obviously, it's about the people, it's about the infrastructure, um, and you know, it goes on, you know, it's about the funding, and then around that you have society, um, you have social, political, economic developments, and then of course, we all operate within, within time as well. And then the biggest circle is laws of nature, and the sun and the moon, and everything else we can't we can't get away from that and I think we have to constantly remember our connection to these so it just got me kind of you know thinking out what what, do, what does that mean and how, how do you constantly um, engage between all of these very very different spaces um, the other point that was very important, I think, in thinking about creativity within the institution is obviously an institution is not static. It is something that's constantly moving all the time. And, you know, things are falling apart and coming together again. And this idea that, okay, every, you know, I've got, you know, the, the perfect team is in place and it's going to, you know, as long as we get this and this and this and this and everything will be right. No, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Things are constantly changing and shifting. And I think the creativity means that you you need to kind of let go as well and you need to be flexible and allow these things to allow these things to change and, and not try to control everything too much so what I want to say is that I'm not some kind of creative genius running the organization um, it takes a village and I cannot emphasize how you know every single member in the team, um, every single uh, member of the community that support us. Um, our chair, Jane Deb Boyce, is here. Uh, Mimi Brown, who's on our board, who's been a longtime supporter. Um, Osgea, so he's our public, you know, the, and, and that's why I've also included this slide, which is the team, because the team is moving, and also people come and go too, and with them they bring different experiences, they bring different ideas, so the institution is something that is constantly moving. Um, so then I just wanted to, is it, am I going too, on too long, but uh, maybe um, just two more points. Um, <laughs> um, what I want to say is that I think also just really thinking about, we, we have been, we were born at a time where the art scene around us is very different to what it is today. And um, things have changed dramatically with all of these institutions opening. And like for us, you know, constantly going back and saying, do we matter? Why are we here? What is the urgency? How do we not repeat what others are doing? And then also to look at the ecology. And I truly believe in, uh, you know, as we have the, uh, the, the, the moon and the sun and um, we also, you know, there is the yin and the yang energy, if you want to put it like that. And there is a lot of yang in the art world. And I think some of what we're trying to do is bring some of the yin in as well. Um, so our work tends to be a slower work, perhaps, and it can take years and years to digitize an archive and to, to bring it online. Um, but I think that is our contribution. Um, and, you know, we are incredibly lucky to be supported by a huge community who have the patience in a world that's moving very, very fast um, to actually support this work that we do. Um, 
yeah, okay, maybe that's just okay. One long, very last point, just about the archive, um, and I just want to say um, that also this this idea of an archive as well. Many people might think that it, it's a very um, painstaking or perhaps, um, you know, it could be a boring practice perhaps, um, but actually within the, I want to say that the archive itself is an incredibly creative space uh, from which to work on in terms of how one negotiates also what it is uh, you document, how you document, how you categorize it, how you respect the person whose archive it is as you're translating it and bringing it into uh, a public space and making it accessible. Um, and also then what you can actually do with it. And as you revisit those histories at different moments in time, um, they all they say something different all the time. And so I just wanted to end by, by perhaps um, dedicating also to Li Wen, um, who is an artist whose um, work we currently have on um, at the archive, his sketchbooks um, from the archive we've been digitizing as archive, and he is a performance artist who um, was based in Singapore. Uh, he recently passed away, uh, but really one of the pioneers of performance art in the region. Um, and I just love this uh, quote that he, he actually uh, wrote a text for us on our website um, in 2010, um, and it was on this slide as well. It's a bit small, but it says, uh, perhaps it was uh, because it was read to me while I was going through the physical manifestations of my own own anxious questioning and musings that the proposition for an anti-disciplinary discipline resisting conclusions has now become my favorite description of performance art. And this was a book that he was passed at the time, and he was actually buried up to his head um, beneath the, the soil in his backyard for, for about 24 hours as his performance, and he was given this um, text, um, and you know, he said, this was, my most this was my favorite description of what performance art is. And these are the challenges, the creative challenges that we need to face uh, on a daily basis within the archive. How can we actually, ha actually capture something that is anti-disciplinary, discipline-resisting conclusions? So, question. Okay, thank you so, so much. Now, Jana. I love the generosity um, with which Claire has suggested that teamwork makes her dream work. And also this idea of writing a more generous history. And I think it's that kind of mission um, that is really at the core of all of our organizations and ensures that um, we can run organizations rather than having the organizations run us, which is what you can get into if you're just dealing on the logistics or the fundraising or the day-to-day. -day. Um, so I think in terms of case study, uh, when I joined in 2016, moving back from Hong Kong with this real idealism, 2016 June, and we arrived, and that was the British referendum. And you realize very quickly that rather than pick sides or complain or suggest that this is the end of the world, you look at Toni Morrison and you think, that's right. This is precisely when artists get to work. So we came into an exhibition of Grace and Perry which was inherited, but which was a terrific moment to say this is a time for us to focus on what unites people rather than divides them. And I think that was the lesson, to think about how uh, really we can focus on putting the voice of the artist in the biggest conversations of the day um, that led to this case study in our first exhibition together, um, which was the exhibition you've seen on the screen here of Zaha Hadid's uh, drawings and notebooks. It was an exhibition um, that came very shortly um, after the passing uh, of our great friend, a Serpentine trustee, a collaborator of Hans Ulrichs, um, and of course who left us the building. And what we found in terms of this exhibition was a note that she had written that suggested there should be no end to experimentation. Uh, and I think for us, that's become the mantra in terms of thinking about um, what continues to uh, bring delight and discovery to our stakeholders, um, to our artists, to our audiences, to our supporters. And so for us, what it's really meant is thinking about, you know, for me, what is CEO of an arts organization? It's chief eternal optimist. Um, so our brand of optimism means that we continue to um, bring in the artists um, that can really uh, generate the kind of, you know, impossible ideas that become improbable when you cross the bridge with Christo and he says, you know, I really need a 20 meter, 7,500 barrel structure over there uh, in the Royal Serpentine Lake. And so rather than thinking that's impossible, you think, okay, we're gonna make that happen. And then you have sleepless nights and you call your partners and friends and frenemies and everything you possibly can. You fundraise, you friendraise, but then you make this new reality happen. And so 
I think for us that reinvention has meant also thinking about what are those new realities. Dennis Gabor said um, the future cannot be predicted, but future can be invented. And for us that meant yanking our digital curator into the role of chief technology officer and saying, Ben Vickers, how are we going to work with VR and AR and AI to give artists like Ian Cheng, like Sandra Perry, like Hito Styro, the kind of tools they need to make sure that they can go further with us than they can go themselves. Um, so, you know, we think about these new experiments in art and technology that Hua will reference, and it could be as simple as the paint tube that was invented that let artists go outside and led to impressionism. And for us, that means that we're continuing to experiment, to realize that partners um, don't often always want to write you a check. Sometimes they just want to uh, enable these new possibilities. And it means that the delight and discovery don't also just focus on the technology that will enable us to have an architecture that complements our physical architecture in an augmented form this summer, it means that we can bring in new networks of people like Virgil Abloh, of Sir David Ajay, um, of the editor of Wired, and say, we're looking for a new kind of architect. Can you go out to your networks? Because we want to op open up opportunities, not only challenging where art can be encountered and by whom, but who gets to work in the arts, which is a really vital question for us today. Um, so I think that's been an incredible premise for us, that idea of experimentation. Um, that idea of inclusion, which is not just about um, race or gender, but it's also um, about socioeconomic diversity. And our community, Westminster, though seemingly very wealthy, is actually the most polarized um, of communities um, across the UK. So we've been focusing uh, on these new experiments in art and technology. Uh, we've been focusing on bringing back some forgotten voices. Uh, we're so excited uh, that Luchita Hurtado this summer is a new discovery of Hans Ulrich and the artistic teams. She's going to have her first exhibition after 97 years uh, of life on this planet. But it's that idea of challenging preconceptions, uh, of discovering new voices, of being more generous uh, in terms of who gets to have that platform, uh, and also being very sensitive. As a final point, in terms of sustainability, um, what sustainability means to us, of course, is very ecologically led. We're in this incredible um, garden. We are uh, in this royal park. We're visited by over a million people each year. We're wildly committed uh, to free art and free thinking, uh, which often to our board in that first year seemed radical to think of this 10 million pound annual budget, um, of which um, the Arts Council is a very generous contributor, uh, but about 15% um, in terms of where we stand. So for us, it's been how do we take that and stretch it even further? How do we take that uh, and really accelerate? Uh, and the sustainability has also meant creating new models, creating new partnerships, creating video games that might heal the planet, um, and really thinking about how we can take our privileged position, um, but focus on sustainability in terms of also gold standard um, for a management model, and focus on the sector convener role. That means that we can share uh, with regional institutions, with institutions up and down the country, that we can go to Barking and Dagenham uh, and bring to a community that's uh, suffering somewhat from deindustrialization and create new kinds of civic engagement um, that really make sure that the arts are there um, to inspire and to create bridges that might not otherwise be there. Yana, thank you so much. Now, Doreen. Thank you very much. Very exciting work. Um, well, the, the National Gallery that I work in is 61 years since it was opened. So it's in our book, it's pretty well established. It was established during the era of colonialism as an outpost of uh, British uh, colonial um, tentacles. And uh, for the opening, they say that it was the biggest uh, movement of art from Europe to Africa. Plain loads of um, work from established institutions from the MoMA, from the National Gallery in London, from the Louvre in Paris, uh, sent their works in order to make this huge statement. And the Queen Mother actually came to open the show. So it was um, an interesting uh, intervention. And after the opening, several of the works stayed in the country. Uh, the, the then gallery director went out and purchased uh, quite a lot of old master artworks and uh, modern work during the sort of 50s. And so the gallery be began. Um, in terms of uh, the, the director, we're fortunate to have a director who 
came to Zimbabwe, came to, then it was Rhodesia, came with the thinking that there must be art that's produced locally. And uh, he, um, he was coming from Paris, he was half English, half French, and in the school of the Picassos of this world who were at that stage fascinated with exotic art or art from Africa. So he was convinced that there was something there and he worked with some of the local people to, to understand what they were into and it happens that somebody brought him some stonework that they were doing and he was very fascinated with it and really encouraged uh, the local artists to go further with the stonework. Uh, originally, they were doing sort of functional work using stone, and he pushed and pushed and uh, worked with them until people began to work on more and more hard stones and really sort of encouraged to express themselves in terms of their history, their culture, what they believed in. And it became a huge success. And uh, this work became what Zimbabwe was recognized for, stone, stone sculpture. And this was before independence. This was from the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, into the 80s. And uh, after the independence, it was realized that you know, we need now um, to encourage more formal training and more diverse uh, arts. So after independence, the gallery opened a school, which was now a formal school to train especially young people in painting and, uh, and uh, sculpture and textiles and photography and various other things. So this was unusual, but it has actually guaranteed us our continuity because we've been training young people since 1981 and we have a very well-established school now from which we're able to draw <laughs> content for the shows. And even as, uh, as we went to, started to go to Venice Biennale in 2011, several of the artists that, we're, that we've been taking since 2011 are actually former graduates from this school. So um, we never thought that that would, would be our thing, but actually it's been a very useful adjunct. And it means that um, we, we, um, we have a continuous um, graduation of young people who are uh, artists and actually most of them now, especially the ones that have been to Venice, are taken up by other galleries uh, inside the country and outside the country. They've been able to source platforms for themselves in terms of not only Venice but in the, um, the big international shows uh, of the world at the um, Tokyo de, de Paris in, in France and many different institutions have been able to uh, find artists from Zimbabwe and, uh, and enjoy a better platform. So in terms of our, our work, we have the gallery, we have the school. We ha we're in a society where art is not that much appreciated. So it's a constant sort of creative struggle to get support, to find partners, and to make a case for the continued uh, artistic presentations, the budgets, um, uh, travel, uh, international uh, events. And uh, I think we've, been, we've not done too badly. In 1962, there was in that gallery the first uh, international conference uh, about Africa. All the Africanists from all over the world came there in 62 to discuss about uh, arts and culture. And some of us who've been in the gallery since the 80s always wanted to have a second edition of this. It, there was a plan to have it every two or three years. It never happened. But in, diff in different parts of the continent, several sort of platforms came about but sort of didn't last very long. Fortunately for us, in 2017, we were able to arrange the second International Conference of African Culture, uh, which was a huge success. It, it, it played on a lot of the success that we've been having throughout 2000 uh, with Venice and international platforms. And we're able to bring a lot of people who are interested in African art, African culture, African contemporary art to Zimbabwe to discuss and dis debate with the view to planning and mapping where are we going with African arts and African contemporary arts and culture. So I think that uh, we're working on a publication for that. Uh, our, our foray into Venice, this is our fifth edition that we're going to participate with the Zimbabwean Pavilion. And we are finding that our artists are being recognized in different parts of the world. Our um, professionals are being invited to speak about what, what we are doing. And I think that I must pay homage to people like Okwe and Bisi, who stood out there um, very boldly and declared that Africa is part of this global global world. And not only declared, but made actual inroads and uh, made it easy for people like us to, to, to believe that we have a place in the international arts community. So I really um, appreciate that 
they opened many, many doors, and not only for other people to see us, but also for us to see ourselves in the global community. And uh, I'm, I really want to honor all of that because we are, we are reaping the benefits. And I think that we can't sort of sing their praises enough for in such short lifespans to have done so much to open up. So thank you very much. Thank you. Irene, thank you so much. Okay, um, I think among the many definitions of the word uh, creativity, uh, one definition might be um, the ability to connect what people usually don't connect. And I think that's, uh, that's uh, something that I'm, I'm trying to do at uh, Bangkok Art and Culture Center. Um, I think in, in many, many countries in the world, uh, when, you, when you talk about like art, or when you talk about culture, I mean, it scares people away. I mean, I was talking to uh, a few uh, teenagers and in front of a, in front of our center, and they say that we didn't want to go in. They they say that we didn't want to go in. I mean, the name sounds very scary, like both the word like art and culture. And I think that's that's the case for uh, many countries in the world, and I think it is important for for each and every one of us uh, sitting here to to make sure that. Uh, we can connect like what we are doing in like, either art or, or cultural activities to everyday life yeah and and trying to also uh, to connect uh, i mean art and science yeah i mean they are they i think they are more uh, connected than 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 we we usually think i mean um i'm not sure that that's the case in in hong kong or not but in in thailand uh, after you finish uh, grade 9 you have to either choose to go on the art track or the science track. So for those of for those of you who don't, who, I mean, who choose the art track, it means that you can never become a medical doctor. So for a fifteen-year-old, how can you know? Yeah. And for those who choose the the, the science track, I mean, it's it's clearly that you cannot be a writer or can you cannot be an an artist. Yeah. I mean that that's I, I don't know whether that's from the UK or I don't know, but but it's still there. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, but but I mean Thailand has never been colonized, so maybe not not UK. Um, uh, but when anyway, I mean uh, this kind of I mean segregation or, or separation is is uh, is an important problem in the in the development of of the country as well. I mean, so I think in uh, when we have uh, any opportunity, like to to connect what we are doing to to the everyday life, we have to take that op opportunity. I'll, I'll give you one example. It can be it can be something. I mean, as simple as this. Uh, we had um, a climate change uh, photography uh, exhibition last June, and then uh, on the on the the day that we opened this uh, exhibition, uh, we started using the the no plastic bag, like policy in the entire building, we we came up with a with a campaign. It's called B A C C B Y O B. Yeah, B Y O B is uh, bring your own bag instead of bring your own beer. Okay, because we are public building, beer is not allowed. So bring B Y O B, bring your own bag. It, it's I mean there are some like complaints. I mean at at the beginning because. Uh, I mean, Thailand is um, it's like among the top five uh, user of plastic bag. <laughs> I'm not very uh, proud of that, but we we I mean we we are trying to do like a little by by little. Um, and then uh, recently, like, like right now, we have a, a exhibition that's um, actually by by a Hong Kong uh, uh, artist, uh, Danny Yung. Um, and uh, he he created a figurine, uh, Tian Tian Xing Sang. It's like a like a white canvas doll for people to paint on. Uh, and we invited uh, not only artists but non-artists as well to to create. Uh, uh, I mean to exercise their creative on on this. And then I and then we have the, the smaller ones for the public, like to paint on like, every morning. And then and then I found out that one of the security guards. Uh, in that gallery has been enjoying doing the smaller ones, so I invited him to do the big ones. And now his his work is exhibited among like all the works by the so-called like professional artists and international artists. I think it, it's important to to encourage, I mean, to show people that everybody have everybody has like creativity. It's just like they need uh, an opportunity to to exercise it. And I think that's that that's a job for for us uh, working in the arts world right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to all our speakers for round two. <laughs> now, uh, I don't know if it works in English, but in French, one can say jamais deux sans trois. 
Never two without three. And that means we're now going into round number three. Now, the thing which I thought would be very important here to address in terms of you know, institutional practice in the 21st century is, of course, the question of the, of the challenge, obstacles, challenges. And um, I always remember when you know, I was a freelance curator until I joined the Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris in Paris. It was kind of week one. Uh, in my job, to work in a museum, and uh, I thought about, you know, lots of constraints. And uh, we were with Felix Gonzalez Torres, who uh, was doing a project, it's a kind of young artist project called Migrateur, it was in the early 90s. Uh, and Felix said, you know, we basically have to um, work with these constraints. We have to work within these constraints. And so he had this wonderful idea. We went to the market, uh, he chose lots of flowers. And then we went shopping and we bought lots of vases. And he basically, his idea was, that was an important part of the exhibition, to put a vase with specially arranged flowers by him into every office, to everybody who worked in the museum, you know, the many, many, many employees of this uh, very bureaucratic organization. And uh, he said, it's got to change. So it was an incredible lesson for me, an incredible you know, experience. And of course, constraints and obstacles. There's even a whole poetry movement called Ulipo. George Perec wrote an entire novel without the letter E. Uh, interesting, I think, you know, in relation to museum practice. But if you think about challenges, it's not only the challenges within the institution, but it's, I think, also important that we think about the planetary challenges. And Jana mentioned, of course, the focus we have at the Serpentine on ecology, the focus we have, I mean, we learned from Gustav Metzger that we should actually not talk about ecology, we should address the phenomenon of extinction, because the world uh, lives through, uh, as it is with Colbert says, a moment of six mass extinction, and we knew need to resist that. It's not only an extinction of species, but it's also an extinction of lots of cultural phenomena which disappear. We need to remember here, as part of the homages, uh, the great English artist Susan Hillon, who left us a few weeks ago, and she did an amazing film, you know, documenting all the languages uh, we are. We are, we, are, we are losing, basically. So that all is, of course, part of the, of the challenges. Then, of course, challenges are also there in terms of society. If you think about inequality, what's the question of inequality in our societies? And what can museums do for that? Tim Berners-Lee, for that reason, wrote uh, for my Instagram, and it's something he said many times for the World Wide Web. It's wonderful, actually, to think about Tim Berners-Lee, because, of course, last week was the 30th anniversary of the World Wide Web. And you know, he says the World Wide Web was invented as a tool for everyone. He, he believes in net neutrality. He, he, he believes this net neutrality is in danger. It's interesting to think about that in terms of museums. So we have 11 minutes left for that very big question. What are the challenges? So, Antonia. Oh my gosh. I always have to go first. I'm not sure about this, Will. Um, well, you said so much of it. I mean, the <laughs> where to begin? Um, I mean, just thinking about our roles, I mean, I guess everybody is walking a, a tightrope all the, all the time. And you know, there's a kind of slippery slide off this tightrope at any given moment. I guess one thing that I think about a lot is this kind of idea of the experience economy and the kind of way that we, we tend to imagine, for real or, or for not, that a new generation coming up has this kind of ADD approach to everything, I mean, courtesy of, of technologies and things like that, and, how d and there's never a greater pressure on museums to act as kind of edutainment or edutain ent entertainment kind of zones. And to sort of be able to counterbalance that experience economy with deeply researched kinds of projects that don't give themselves up easily, and to be able to fight for those and to keep their place in the museum, because I really don't believe that there's a kind of distinction in audiences for those two things. I think when challenged, audiences rise to the occasion, and one of the, alongside a sort of self-censorship, is a tendency to underestimate the audience at all times. So it's to keep challenging is one of those things. And then for other kind of more personal, which maybe would apply to other people around the, the, the table too, is this kind of just lack of materials. We have a huge scarcity of uh, arts-related materials, particularly in, in Arabic. And so that kind of, which obviously we're trying to address a lot through the library and through small-scale publishing. But, you know, you can campaign for kids to be able to study art in schools. But then if you realize they're, they're using, you know, the A to Z of Western art or Picasso today or whatever, you know, that they don't then have a chance to actually be able to gain knowledge about their own artists from their, their own region in the language, in their first language. So that is an absolute kind of priority. 
for us. Thank you very much, Antonia. Claire? Um, <coughs> Hello? Yeah, no, it was on. <laughs> Um, well, I guess, uh, gosh, everything can be a challenge. It's your attitude towards it. I mean, it can be a challenge to wake up in the morning and get dressed sometimes. So, I, you know, it, I think it's, um, I guess the beauty of being able to work in the art field is that we are working with artists and, and uh, your example of, I'm, I'm sorry, I think it was I, of putting flowers, you know, in, oh, Felix, sorry, I got it. Um, <clears throat> Those kind of strategies in terms of changing attitudes are something that we can constantly learn from um, within an institute, within an arts organization. Um, and so, you know, we, we pick up the energy and, and the ideas of people that are around us. And so when we're around artists and people who think in very creative and different ways, obviously we are influenced by them and we can bring that back into the institution as well. But really, you know, there, there are, uh, I mean, you know, all of us, you know, believe in, as Jana would say, creating a, a safe space for unsafe ideas, um, and perhaps I'll just um, end, you know, and with a with a, a Taoist story of this um, this monk who uh, was in his, you know, he likes to in his hut he would meditate naked every single day, and down in the village all of the other monks would get really upset about it. And what's he doing meditating naked in his in his hut every day? You know, so they went up there, you know, to tell him like put your pants back on. And he looked at them and he said, listen, the universe is, is my house. This hut is my pants. What are you doing in my pants? You know, so it's constantly a matter of just shifting the way that we look at the world. And it's a sh constantly shifting and asking those things. So there are many you know, people who, who are adverse to, to many ideas out there. And that's our job out there, to, to, to shift that attitude. Yeah. Claire, thank you so much, Yana. I think following from there, it is that idea of art for all. And of course, coined by Gilbert and George, whom Hans Ulrich and I often dress as um, in the same checked suit. Um, but that idea of really attracting those audiences and once they're there, um, assuring them that there is a gateway. I was um, so impressed uh, to um, see Tobias the Today um, Tycoon and to see a show which you know, starts with a pamphlet that says, what is contemporary art? Um, and I think that's just a beautiful gateway for him. He's suggesting that 85% of the people who are entering that incredible space um, are entering a museum for the first time. And I think all of our responsibilities there are to ensure that you do create those openings, that you do create those opportunities. Um, it's not just here in Hong Kong, spending a lot of time uh, in the education projects we work in. I walked up to a school up the street 10 minutes away and I said, how many people have been to the Serpentine. Let me see, how many people have been to the Serpentine in this room? That's about 30 more hands than had gone up in that room um, because no one had been to the Serpentine galleries because they felt contemporary art was not for them. So it's this idea of going just beyond the free. It's creating structures like our Serpentine Pavilion, which this year um, will be created by Yunya Ishigami, which last year was created by the first female architect, which um, had the incredible Frances Kere from Burkina Faso. Um, it's continually shifting those rules because at the end of the day, our education system is flawed as well. Um, our chairman, Mike Bloomberg, is shocked that we come from an economic background, um, but we're fighting to put arts back in the system. And this idea of what will the future of work look like, well, in the future of work, creativity is what's going to robot-proof us and enable us to keep shifting. So I think it's that power of transformation that we need to keep espousing. Uh, and I think it's that challenge to make sure everyone feels that art is for them. Thank you so much, Jana. Doreen. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that is the issue, actually. The fact that um, from all our different societies, whether we have uh, affluence or non-affluence, it is about relevance and remain and getting our um, supporters and the government to be able to see that it is of relevance beyond just sort of um, a, a few talent, the talented few. And this is a challenge uh, we have every day to sort of you know, get the budget, keep the budgets coming, um, get the, uh, the authorities to be able to support the building. We have lots of challenges, believe me, in terms of air conditioning, old buildings. And, uh, but that's what keeps us creative because we're constantly looking for partners to be able to support things. We're constantly having to negotiate new relationships that in exchange for this, you are going to get that. And 
while keeping the artists, you know, their, their space free so that they can work and be creative. So it's a constant challenge, but it's one which, when the rewards come and you can see that uh, the artists are um, being globally recognized, they are constantly creating and making something from nothing, then that is very, very encouraging, and that's what keeps us going. Thank you. Doreen, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I think um, I think in in arts management in general, you're dealing with uh, patrons, uh, artists, and or, uh, and the visitors to the museum. Uh, and I think you you have to make a a good balance like between the three. And when there's always like there's always problems in in one or two or like a three aspects of this uh, that you have to deal with. Um, but I think to, to keep to keep a good balance. And then I I second like uh, many. Of my colleagues' uh, opinion here, that uh, art, I mean, contemporary art, uh, for uh, any democratic country, um, needs to be like for all, and it is our job to prove that uh, it is like for them to not only appreciate it or understood, but also criticized like freely as well. And that's, I think, that's that's uh, part of uh, any democratic uh, system. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pavi. <laughs> now. One thing we, we discussed before in the, in the, in the green room, uh, which I wanted to share to wrap up this panel, because often important things happen in the green room, and I thought it uh, you know, would be great to share that with all of you. I think we discussed this idea you know, of the necessity of new alliances. And given the challenges of institution in the 21st century within you know, globalization, or what Edouard Glissant calls within mondialité, it seems more urgent than ever that institutions are not competing with each other, but collaborate, because th that's the key thing. I mean, Isabel Stengers wrote this wonderful book with Ilya Prigozhin, which leads a little bit like a manifesto of what institutions could do. Uh, and the book is called New Alliances, that we need new alliances. And it was very exciting to start this discussion, what the five institutions uh, could do together. We hope to continue this in the next uh, couple of months. And we are very grateful to all of you for being here, immensely grateful to our amazing speakers. Please give a very big round of applause to Antonia, to Claire, to Jana, to Doreen, to Pavit. Yeah.